When anger is suppressed, we become forest fire. Black riots are cultural burnings. The laying of waste is the cause for regeneration. Taking in fresh breath requires that we release the things that do not serve or protect the black body. And we will take our place in the future. As summer turns to fall, we will forge new states from the skeletons of burnt buildings, bend metal like blood work into new arcs of justice that are capable of delivering on their promise. I promise that water will come. In response to attack, I have seen love move like currency through the arteries of our body politic to where the burning took place. Thank you. Love is anti-inflammatory. The rainwater to carry us, coagulate us, make us one body and disperse us to where we are needed most come winter. Our immune system will be perfected. But today we pray. Hmm. Um, I received that sitting in a deserted field in between an apartment complex and a kidney dialysis center. It's the strangest place where half of the lawn is mowed perfectly and the other half is just wild. And I met a whole family of yellow dock there. Um, and so yellow doc and I for the past, for the summer, um, have been thinking a lot about release work. Um, if you know yellow doc or the Rumix family, I know, I know they're herbalists here, I see you. Um, then you understand that yellow doc has an affinity for the large intestines and for peristalsis and removing all the things out. But what most people don't know is the way that native and indigenous people use yellow doc. Many of them, including the Cherokee, use yellow dock in order to control the hemorrhage of bleeding in the lungs. They use yellow dock as a respiratory agent. Mm. And the way that we make sense of this is looking at traditional Chinese medicine who recognizes that the lungs and the large intestines are intimately connected. The body is an integrated system, and in that system, we understand that releasing is as important as taking in. And in fact, releasing what is old is required for us to breathe freshly. And so as we are thinking about all the things that are burning, um, I want us to really be in the practice of what are we letting go of and what are we making space for, right? Fire creates ash, <laughs> which is earth. Um, and earth gives us the fertile soil to build whatever it is that we want to do. And so um, in this portal, in this plant portal, um, we are going to be doing some of that rebuilding. Uh, and we are going to be centering herbal medicine as people's medicine. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with you. You could make the presentation as small or as, as big as you want depending on how much you want to see my mouth moving. <laughs> but whatever you want, it's up to you. I'm going to share this. All right. Can you all see the presentation? Beautiful. So the topic is herbal medicine as people's medicine, um, embodied sovereignty and Afrofuturism. I wanted to give you a roadmap so that you know where we're going uh, and where we're coming from. But anyways, so uh, we're going to start by interrogating and really being with Neri Okorafor, one of my favorite Nigerian African futurist artists, um, and to really take her text and to explore what it is that she has to offer us in terms of remedy. Um, and then we're going to talk about the principles of a people's medicine. It's not gonna be an exhaustive list, but I've tried to consolidate it into three main topics. Um, and then we're gonna have a really good, yummy amount of time for question and answers. Um, and each section will have uh, different activities. The ask today is that you all are um, going to be an inquiry with me. <laughs> the ask is that uh, we are open and available for vulnerability. 
um, that we are able to share with each other and that you can show up however it is you want to. Um, and so I, I hope that we can create a resonance frequency that spreads beyond and within sort of this conference into thinking about how we practice herbal medicine on an individual level and on a national level. So let's begin. Um, so before we go into who fears death, um, I wanna talk a little bit about my herbal lineage. Um, one of my favorite futurists is um, Gloria E. Andanzua. Um, she wrote an amazing um, book. She writes, uh, she's a queer Latinx um, poet, essayist, philosopher, um, who has created this concept of mestizaje. Um, so I live uh, in what's called the Four Corners. I'm on the Cheyenne, Ute, and Arapaho territories here. Colorado is largely influenced by Mexican culture. In fact, Colorado was a part of Mexico for the longest time. Our state means the color red, right? Um, and so when we situate ourselves in place, we don't also, it's, it's not just our ancestry that we bring to bear, but the ancestry of the people of the land who we were with. And so Mestizaje and honoring Gloria Andanzua and this concept, which is beautiful, um, of not denying any part of ourselves. The fact that the vast majority of us have mixed genetics um, means that the vast majority of us have mixed medicine. Um, and so in thinking about sort of my medicinal lineage, I pull heavily on the feminist movement of the 1970s. Um, there was a book written by, uh, and I have notes. So if I look down at my notes, know that it's because I want to be excellent. <laughs> but uh, Barbara Earnwright uh, and Deidre English wrote Witches, Midwives, um, and Nurses, a, a History of Women Healers. And it's in that text that I first heard the phrase of herbal medicine being people's medicine. In this book, they directly drew the lineage from the witch burnings in Europe and the demonization of herbal medicine, but all women's healing work, the establishment of the American Medical Association um, in order to segment the power to heal within the hands of a few wealthy white males. Um, and so in the feminist movement, you had this uprising of white women actively deconstructing their father's castle, right? Actively bringing back, unearthing, making space for practices in order to heal the wounds that they have in their own ancestry. Um, it's important to remember that white women were the first group of people to be colonized. They practiced on them first. Um, and so as we leave that, we look more into what else is happening in the Americas and the consequence of um, demonizing herbal medicine and of, of attaching it to um, the devil and devil worship and all of these things. And so you have large groups of Africans whose blood came into the scene. Um, and these folks brought with them not only their sacred plants like okra, their sacred plants like black eyed peas, their sacred plants like plenty of the foods, but also right here, Sansevieria is another plant that they brought with them, but their practice was delegitimized. And so on plantations, um, they were discouraged from using herbal medicine because it was the devil's work. But still, we had all of these occurrences of grannies who knew how to practice their herbal medicine. And in fact, um, some of our, our greatest healers, people like Harriet Tubman, um, were also herbal medicine practitioners. Um, and so what happened in the places where Black and Indigenous bodies collided was this beautiful melding of African plant ways with the flora fauna and the people of these lands. Um, and so from the South, we get the creation of practices like hoodoo, which combine Black and Indigenous medicine ways. Um, and coming up from the Southwest, we get Kuanderismo, which is a combination of African, indigenous, and the other practices and life ways of folks in Mexico. 
And all of these sort of pathways have this way of merging, especially here in Colorado. Um, and so what arises um, out of the meetings of all these bloodlines and the meetings of all these peoples is the development of herbal practices that are representatives and that have all the lineages present. Um, and so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about who fears death. Um, so who fears death is um, one of my favorite books. So Neti Okorafor, she's Nigerian. Um, and she says what she does is African futurism versus Afrofuturism. Um, and why she says that is because she's trying to distinctively center um, Black narratives that are non-Western. Um, and so she's able to really take um, stories, cultures, life ways, traditions of folks in Africa and blend them into speculative fictions in ways that are beautiful. Um, and so to situate us here in this text of Who Fears Death, um, the protagonist, Anye Sewu, um, is really on her hero's journey. She is traveling through the desert and she comes up, she bumps into this mythological people called the Red People. Um, and this is one of the reflections that she has. So if we could, I would like someone else to read this. Um, so if you would like to read this passage, if you can maybe um, raise your, put your hand up or do something like that. <laughs> I would say put an asterisk in the chat box, but I don't know if you can do that. You can raise your hand by clicking on the participants and then um, there's a little button. So that's a way you can virtually do that. There you go, Austin. You should be able to meet, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So will you give, can, will you read this for us? Yes, I will. I love this book, by the way. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Zula, The Moving Village. What made Zula most comfortable for me was what made them different from any society I knew. Everyone here could build a rock fire. They just knew how to do it. Juju was part of their way of life. It was so normal that they felt no need to ever fully understand it. I never asked them if they knew these minor jujus instinctively or if they had been taught. It seemed a rude question, like asking how one learned to control his urine. My mother had been like the va in how she accepted the unanswerable and the mystical. But when we got to Joahir, to civilization, it had become something to hide. In Joahir, it was only acceptable for elders like Aro, like Ada, or Nana, the wise to know Juju. For anyone else, Juju was an abomination. What would I have been it like if I had grew up here? Thank you, Austin. Will you stay with us here? Can I continue to chat with you? Can yeah. you my, my partner in this since you read the text? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so we're asking ourselves, like, what would it have been like if I grew up here? Austin, can I ask, um, did you grow up in any mystical traditions? Um, I grew up in a Southern Baptist culture um, where root work is both a, a daily practice and, and a deep secret. Mm. So... Um, it was, it's under the guise of, of God and, and Jesus. So it didn't seem mystical to me growing up, but now that I'm leaning back into it, I'm just like, whoa, that's what all that was. And so, yeah. Yes. Hmm. So it's, it's this question of like, um, what I noticed that there are certain families and they do certain things, but it's not ever explained why you do this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm always like, I'm always excited to hear. <laughs> like a lot of my Asian friends be like, well, my mama said during the summer, like you don't eat cold food. And I'm like, why she say that? Like, what mama talk about, you know? But there's all these ways of, uh, all the ways that all of these small magics sort of exist in our world, but we don't ever recognize them as that because it becomes normalized. 
Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there's all these areas in our world where magic is condemned. And so it creates this paradox that almost makes those practices more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna, so this is our first little question. We're gonna open up this Zoom chat and have a brainstorm. Um, and so reading this text got me fired up. Uh, my best friend, like Cherie Brown, we had our whole Afro Future book club and we were like, ah, let's read all the things. And she loved the ending because she's like, rewrite everything. But this was my favorite part because it was like, oh, they democratize magic. Like you have this patriarchal society where Anya Sebu comes from and only a few people are alert, like allowed to practice magic and everyone else is kind of struggling and like, you know, suffering about it. And it created this like hierarchy, this magical class who had all the knowledge and everyone else who was beholden to them. And then it perfectly, without being vulgar about it, um, contrasted it with this red group of people um, who not only was magic democ democratized, but that democratization also led to alternative family structures. And so in the text, um, paternity was not linked to relation. It was, it was like wild, but they were like happy and beautiful. But it really got me thinking about like what happens when everyone has access to magic, like what, what would become available? Um, so in this section, we're gonna ask what becomes possible in a world where everyone can evoke health? And to answer this question and, and go into it, um, I want us to think about um, if you know what's healthy and you know how to heal your body, what products are going to be like sold in a grocery store, right? What, um, what, what fast food companies are going to be allowed to exist and be used by people? Um, what are the buildings in our life designed like if people know how health is created? Are we going to be sitting in chairs all the time if folks have a, what, what, so these are some of the questions that I want us to begin to, to think about. If, if you knew what made you healthy, um, what would the world actually look like? How many hours a day would you work? So we're gonna look um, to the Zoom chat. Um, and I'm gonna, I want you to type in some, some of your imaginings. Can you just say the question out loud? And I'm gonna put it in the chat to you, Asia. Absolutely. So that question is, what becomes possible in a world where everyone can evoke health? So we got <laughs> lots of options for composting toilets. <laughs> got it. More time spent outdoors, so much more. A healthcare system, oh, it's going way too fast for me to catch up with, okay. <laughs> healthcare system that we know it'd be radically transformed or collapsed. We would prioritize wellness over comfort and ease. Herbalism drive through, I see you. <laughs> People would go to the flow. There'd be forest access, fresh markets, bare feet, dirty feet, gardens, lots of green space, edible blocks. Respect is everywhere. Um, there's not going to be any sharp corners. Uh, we're going to pulverize. Uh, Pulverize of understanding epistemologies and ontologies, multiple practice. Absolutely. Because if everyone knows health, then everyone's going to have a different way of exercising health depending on where it is that they live. Right? So, health in Colorado is different from health in Florida. They're not the same. And so, thank you for that. Everyone would have self healing practices, planting seeds, no more pharma, more creative time, healthcare, holistic basic income. We would be on the edge of energy medicine mm. and maybe exploring other planets, no straight lines, care for the elderly and the differently able, more physical labor, body liberation and radical accessibility. Mm. <laughs> Sexuality, food system, housing and health, they'd all be linked. Yes, I like it. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to be able to read all of these, but the gift economy, sacred and comedy, Free air, yes, yes, yes. Celebrate death everywhere. Mm. 
learning from future. Lots of hugs. Yes. Orgasm, healing, liberation, and school systems. Yes. Right? Our world would be radically fucking different. <laughs> If we had access to the things that heal our body, if we knew that sitting in front of a screen for eight hours causes vitamin A depletion and destroys our retina, then we would only sit in the screen for two hours. Or better yet, what if computers were designed so that they created health instead of took it away, right? What would a computer look like if being with it made you healthy? This is the kind of futures where we can imagine where all of our technology increases our health and this goes beyond a watch that tells you what your heartbeat is right this is a watch that helps you to be in synchronicity with the person right next to you so that you can speak a heart language right this is the kind of technology that becomes possible when we center health and well-being um Yes, the questions are still rolling. Oh, these are so good. So we're going to save all these up and then you can like get them at the end, you know? I love that. Read the transcript. <laughs> okay, so um, what becomes possible? What becomes possible? All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. And we are going to enter into this conversation of herbal medicine as people's medicine. Um, hmm. So, what becomes impossible uh, in current paradigms is that when people don't have access to their health, then when they are burdened by their health, then they don't have access to new and different ways of being. Simply wearing a backpack, this is a beautiful experiment, but simply wearing a backpack. <laughs> Two people, right, looking up a hill. The one with the backpack on is going to interpret the slope of the hill to be steeper, right? They're going to see that there's going to be more barriers in front of them by simply having a backpack on. And so when we are forced to contend with our bodies not being healthy because our water has been poisoned, because our food has been debased, right, because even our conception of our body has been contorted by advertising agencies, right? When our body becomes an issue for us, then we don't have access to other ways of imagining and other ways of being because we are worried and thinking about that. One of the ways that uh, all the supremacies work is that the people who aren't burdened by uh, social constructs, they get access to their full power. But if you are a woman walking into a room, then you're like, I'm a woman, and you're noticing that. But instead of noticing that and planning something, you see, it's these are all burdens. And so the idea is, how do we make health not a burden for people? And so what are some of the principles of herbal medicine as people's medicine? Um, herbal medicine as people's medicine can give us access to resiliency. Um, one of the questions is, what kind of local health uh, what kind of local health structures could respond to a global pandemic? So one of the reasons why we went into social isolation was because we wanted to flatten the curve, right? We didn't want to put burdens on our depreciating healthcare system. They didn't have the resources to actually take care of all the people that were sick. Huh? So what would it be like if half those people who were sick knew how to handle it at home, what would our world, what would our shape to the coronavirus had been if the everyday nutritional balance of folks were, was high up? What if they already got vitamin D? What if they already, you know, were eating lots of vitamin What if they were already healthy? What would the response to the pandemic be? And what would the impact on the economy have been? Um, and so a resilient structure, right? is one which is able to take an attack with something, these hierarchical structures where energy resources are, are concentrated only in hospitals. If you cut off one hospital, right, then you cut off everyone's access, then everything kind of falls to pieces. But if you have multiple nodes of power where people have access to healing, right, 
if one of those healers is sick one day, then there's still other healers that folks can go to. We're trying to create systems that look less like hierarchical structures. There's nothing wrong with hierarchies, by the way, I'm just saying. They have their things, but less like hierarchy, more like nodes, more like networks, right? What if a herbalist was positioned in every community and instead of paying health insurance, to a pharmaceutical industry, what if everyone gave them $10 a month? What would it be like? Uh, so self-efficacy and determination is offered when we, herbal, when we practice herbal medicine as people's medicine. Um, self-efficacy is the sense that you can do it, right? So when I was experiencing obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Dandelion showed up for me. She said, they use me. I'm here for you. OCD is an earth imbalance. What's going to ground you? Talk to, it was a whole situation. But the dandelion, I swear to God, three drops and it took it all away. My ability to heal myself and the confidence that comes from that is what's available to everyone. And once you can heal yourself, the sky's the limit, right? Self-determination means that no one gets to decide if you live or die. Um, no one else gets to decide if your community is going to have poison in it, if you are going to be subject to toxics, whatever, right? If you know how to practice herbal medicine, then there are specific herbs that will actually defend your body against the common pollutants that we see coming off of smokestacks, right? We have herbs that allow you to detoxify so that you are not privy to what the structures in the system where they place you. Um, unshakable relationships. My favorite organization in Colorado is called Queer Nature, and it's a, it's a, it's a space for queer and trans individuals um, led by So and Pinar um, to, instead of identifying with gender constructs that they have no control over, it's so much easier to identify with the earth itself. So who am I as a being of this planet, as a human versus these labels of black and da da da, it's all contentious. But when I see and understand myself as a being and as a part of this relationship of life, that is so much more powerful than any social group can give me. And so the idea of practicing herbal medicine as people's medicine is that you create unshakable relationships with plants that no one can intervene in. Uh, dandelion becomes your sister, right? Oak, your, your grandpa. Um, and this relationship to the earth, this is the grounding in the home that everyone is looking for. And it's possible, you know, through herbal medicine as people's medicine, you can eat it <laughs> and be it. The other thing um, that it gives us is power. Power to the people. <laughs> power to the people. Um, so the core principles of herbal medicine um, the first principle is relational. The second is bioregional and simple. And we're going to go into these. Um, the relational aspect is really, really important. Um, and so uh, in the relational aspect of herbal medicine, we center direct experiences of the plants. Um, plants are people. And when we understand plants as people and we talk to them like whole beings, it changes everything about how we work with plants, right? No longer are we making tinctures where we shake the jar up every day because we're like, what I want to be shaken up every day, <laughs> right? No longer are we using like grain alcohol, which is, which, oh, you look at the plant and it's just ripped apart when people are using 80, uh, yeah. Everclear? If you drink Everclear, are you going to die? Why would you put a plant in that? So we really start to change the way that we make medicine when we consider the plant's experience of being with us, right? What was the plant's experience of being harvested? What was the plant's experience of being made in this way? Um, and it also changes the practitioner's role. Um, instead of being focused on me, my power, my magic, it's all about the plant. I'm just a facilitator. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a portal. <laughs> so I could connect you with the plants that are whispering to me, but this is your relationship. 
And so when we are working in our herbal practice, um, herbalists, like all business folks, like all people who need life and money, we center, we'll often center ourselves in those relationships. But what happens when we practice a people's medicine is that we give the people the ability to heal themselves. So they don't actually need us anymore, right? Our industry is self-defeating. <laughs> It's like, it's like nonprofits, you know, they should end. <laughs> but they are perpetual. It's like, stop it. Solve the issue and go away. <laughs> but anyway, it's not built like that. But it changes the practitioner's world from magical, godlike, knower of the things to relationship builder. We become a mushroom. Um, and so getting deeper into that aspect of relationality, um, I want to do a practice with you. Uh, so before we begin this practice, um, you don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. Um, and so every single one of these practices is optional. You can take the time to go kick it and get some water, whatever it is that you want or that you need. Um, this practice is called being with. Um, and you're going to we have 88 participants, so that's good. Um, so you are going to be in a breakout room and you all are going to just be with each other. You're going to notice each other. You're going to see each other. Um, and so we have some questions for you and this person to, to answer in a practice, but um, we're actually gonna have a demonstration, okay? Awesome. <laughs> You want to be my partner? Sure. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> so we're just going to demo what this is like. And then the rest of y'all are going to go into your groups and, um, you know, get real with each other. Like, this is how real that I want you to be with your plants. Okay. And not some, you know, what your plant in your house or your backyard or your park. Okay. This is our model. Um, and so, Austin, I'm just going to pin you. I'm going to pin this video so I can see you. Um, and I don't want to be all up in your business, but I'm going to be all up in your business, OK? I, I just pinned your video, so it's, it's just us right now. <laughs> it's just us. That's just the way. It, OK, anyways. Um, and so the first question um, is going to be, hold on one second. So we're just going to say, sitting with you, I notice. Um, and this could be your, your bodily sensations, the feelings that are coming up for you about the others, places that are tense. It's whatever it is that you would like to notice. Um, and so I will, I will go first. Um, and <laughs> so... Sitting with you, I notice um, the squareness of your glasses. And then you, oh, yeah. okay, okay. And we'll just go back and forth. Okay, great. Sitting with you, I notice the peach or coral of your shirt against your skin tone. Hmm. Sitting with you, I notice um, the feeling of the air um, on my arms when you notice me. Mm. Sitting with you, I feel alive and excited to be here. Mm. Sitting with you, I notice sensation um, in my hips, and I felt all of this joy kind of rise up in my body. Sitting with you, I see the visual of a spirit face that is the sun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay we're gonna <laughs> we are, that was so perfect and that was an inside joke <laughs> so 
Thank you so much, Austin, for being my partner. Thank um, you. <laughs> and um, uh, let's see. And now we are going to return. We're going to break off in groups. Um, the facilitators are going to give you um, the facilitators are going to give you like little time stamps and when you should change the question and then we'll come back as a big group and do some digestion about what the experience was like. Yes, I see you, Sarah. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Yay, okay, okay, welcome back. Oh, can we have someone um, speak on what that experience was like, either to see or to be seen by someone else? Go ahead, Adrian, Adriana. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, I was with Jem, and, and we had this beautiful connection. Our hearts poured open, and we talked about her being in my heart forever, and I almost cry, and my voice is trembling because we felt a beautiful expansion, just talking from the heart and, and creating poetry from just breathing and being there, and I noticed we are plants, and our, our words are medicine, and our hearts are infinite, and everything is possible. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Sophie. How are you, Sophie? Well, thank you. I, um, I was with Donnie, and I feel like truly and profoundly seen, and I am touched and deeply appreciative for being offered this moment and your intention asian helping carry this forward um yeah i'm like really struck by the profundity of depth that can be achieved in such a short amount of time yes yes we can have it we deserve it we deserve everything to be this juicy right um i'm gonna move back into the the presentation Oop. where'd the presentation go <laughs> um hmm. would anyone else like to share marissa did have her hand up um she just put it down but thank you thank you hi sorry you said you were moving on so i lowered my hand but um i was partners with austin and let me tell you, if any of y'all get to meet them personally, it will be a blessing. Mm. We had such a vibe going on. It was so great. Thank you so much, Austin. Thank you. I'm blushing. Man, I'm still blushing. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Uh, this is the kind of relationship that we get to have with plants, too, okay? When we engage with plants, it's not going to be from a place of superiority and domination. It's not going to be from a place of expectation. It's not going to be a plant of already knowing who they are based on something you read on the internet, right? When we get to be with plants, we get to see them for who they are in that moment. And we get to acknowledge them, even though they may be a part of a collective, as the individuals that they are. And so what I encourage for you is to move sort of these beautiful human relationships to the other than human beings, because they too want to have experiences. My favorite practice that I'll share with you is breathing with plants. Um, we breathe in oxygen and exhale uh, CO2. Plants breathe CO2 and exhale oxygen. And so to go into a deep relationship um, and to go into a deep relationship with a plant, all you need to do is breathe with that same plant for 10 minutes a day. 
just sit there and breathe with them, breathe on them <laughs> and be nourished by the metabolization that's happening in your body, moving into their body and their body, moving into your body and see what becomes available. Um, and so let me go back to share the screen. I'm cognizant of how much more time we have together. Um, Um, I'm gonna unpin that. Okay. So core principles, we have our relational principle. We have our being with exercise. Okay. Let's talk about bioregional. Um, this is one of the principles that I didn't hear a lot from any of my herbal teachers and my herbal mentors. Um, but this for me is the pillar of sustainability and making sure that herbalism does not become commoditized. Um, so each place in the United States, for example, I'm in Colorado. Um, and so Colorado uh, was the home of a number of different Plains Indians. Right, and so because we are a grassland, uh, because we have a desert climate, because we are high altitude and on one side of a mountain, that shapes not only what our nutritional needs are, but it shapes the flora and the fauna that are here. Um, and so when it comes to diet, for example, when you look at all the peoples around the world who live at similar altitudes, they eat red meat even the Dalai Lama <laughs> eats red meat. Um, and, and why, so why would Plains Indians, for example, center a diet around the bison? Um, one of the reasons why is because red meat has an abundant source of heme iron, which helps our bodies in oxygen transport. And so when you live at a high altitude, your body has to struggle more to breathe and what's beautiful is that God has created or indigenous people has created or the land has created such that the animals that we need to consume are here for us. The plants that grow in my Colorado bioregion, um, because of the extreme weather conditions, they tend to develop higher amounts of vitamins like vitamin A and exposure to sunlight. Um, why does that matter? Because the more vitamin A I eat, the less likely I am to be burned since I'm closer to the sun, okay? Every single bioregion has, um, has these particularities and the plants that grow there take on the medicine that your body is going to need, right? Um, and so when we move into a bioregional context, um, we are, we are not able to cause the exploitation of rare and endangered plants from other people's livelihoods, right? When we are focused in the Colorado bioregion or in the New Mexico bioregion and we're not participating in too much trade, right? Then that means not only is our environmental footprint shortened, but our relationship to the exploitation that happens when people are far away from us is also changed. So not only does eating and participating in herbal medicine bioregionally mean that the plants themselves are evolved and adapted for the medicine that we're gonna need, it also means that we are not participating in exploitative trade. It also means that we actually get to have a living relationship with the plants that grow near us. Okay, so there's something about the, the sadness of immigrating to a different country and having to sort of recoup your culture through commodity goods that no longer reflect where it came from. So when I eat a plantain in Colorado, even though my West African heritage is like, yes, put some palm oil on it, right? It's not going to be what I could get if I was in Ghana. And that plantain was harvested green and shipped all in and it got here. So it's not going to have that taste and that feel, right? It's always going to be the idea of food versus that real food. And one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves as our lineages are moving, as climate changes, our bodies will move. 
we will be shifting continents in ways that we've not seen it before. But my favorite example of what Bioregion has to offer is my favorite director, Hayao Miyazaki, his movie Spirited Away. Does anybody know Spirited Away? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, do y'all remember that scene um, where the protagonist, she's, she's in the spirit world for the first time, and then she starts to disappear, right? And Haraku, um, he comes and he tells her, he's like, eat this, you know, eat this or you'll disappear. Um, this is also a conversation about how we adapt to the land. Um, if you do not eat the food of the land, then you do not become the land. You do not become of the land. You are not shaped by the land. You become separate from it. And so eating the foods, there were some beautiful questions around um, regional food systems. Eating the food of your land makes you a part of that land. It weaves you into that land. And I read this really beautiful thing about um, indigeneity and it was talking not about people but about plants and it said that a plant becomes indigenous to a bioregion after 500 years of being there and living there and I was thinking a lot about you know my immigration story and we're like we're like 400 years in and so one of my questions that I was asking myself was um, what would it be like if I made Colorado my home uh, what would it be like if I grounded in, if I set my roots, um, if I became Colorado? And, and, and so from then on, I have only participated in, and tried to participate in bioregional food economies. Um, and, and what that looks like is that my, my chickens are my own and my milk comes from the raw dairy and my meat comes from my rancher and my vegetables comes from Frontline Farms, which is a black owned amazing farm organization here. And not that this is accessible to everyone, but what weeds and what herbal medicine makes possible, that even if you cannot afford to participate in bioregional food, eh, you can always eat the greens, right? Eat the weeds that are growing. And in that way, um, you adapt and you become of the land. And so the next activity, um, I'm looking at the time and I wanna make sure that we have the time. So these are some of the, oh, uh, here's Bay. I might not be able to talk about Bay, but it's okay. So these are some of the questions um, that we wanna ask ourselves when we enter into a community. Um, there's a way to be in a new place without gentrifying that place and without colonizing that place. And all you have to do is weave yourself into what's already there, right? Um, and so these are some of the questions um, that I want you to maybe write down and begin to ask yourself when it comes to you joining a new group that you're not used to, a different identity group or something like that. Um, and these are some of the questions that you can start to ask, you know. Uh, what permissions do I need? I would like to say something about the permissions. Yes. In Finland, we have this really, really nice uh, law that is called the Everyman's Right. And I don't know in how many other countries of the world that exists, but um, it's a kind of a right that you have. You can go and, and pick up, for example, berries or mushrooms or, on another person's property as long as you don't go to, to the vicinity of their yard. So like if there is a, somebody who owns a lot of forests, something, I have the right to go to the forest and pick up berries or mushrooms, or whatever I find there. I just wanted to share it, and, and, and I really don't know in how many countries in the world the same thing is available. I think that's a beautiful question. Um, Finland has been able to preserve the commons, 
right? And so um, most Western industrialized nations got rid of the commons, um, centering instead property ownership. And they got rid of the commons because they wanted people to work or die. They didn't want you to be able to survive um, and still, um, because they were trying to convince folks to work for someone else to sell their labor to industrial people. So poverty um, was created in order to incentivize uh, people to join the workforce. And so I think that's really beautiful that folks in Finland have access to a commons. And yeah, I wonder if there's anyone else um, on the call who um, also has a commons in, in your culture. Commons is one of the things that Native and Indigenous people here in the United States are asking for. They want to be able to have access to um, their traditional lands. Um, and they don't because there's, there's a fence and they can't pass the fence. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our awareness. Um, Mr. Copeland, did you have a thing? Um, I was going to say there are a couple questions from the chat. I didn't know if you want to do that now or after this part. We're going to do it after this part. Is that okay? Of course. Okay, so the, the last principle of herbal medicine is people's medicine is simplicity. Um, working with one plant at a time is, is for me, in my opinion, in my practice, my lineage, the most powerful way to work with the plant. So if you notice on your supplement bottle or you, know, you have an herbalist and they make a tea and whatever and they have all these herbs mixed in there, what that does is it isolates you from the plant itself. Um, you don't know which plant in that mixture is doing what medicine. You then become dependent on herbalism as a product, right? And you have to go back to the same person again and again to get that product. But when you're working with simples, which is one plant at a time, um, then you get to know exactly who that plant is. This is a question of safety. If you have an adverse reaction to somebody's mixture, um, then you don't know which plant you're allergic to and you might just throw out the whole thing. Like every, every fruit in the fruit salad is a no, right? Um, and so when it comes to safety, working with one plant at a time, well prepared, right? Um, will give you the ability to discern what's actually happening in your body. And it prevents really the commoditization of plant medicine. Um, because if it's one plant on the label, then you can go get that plant yourself, right? And so having it be simple has this benefit of detaching it, it from, com like from commoditization. And we know what happens there. It also creates an intimate relationship, right? And so for example, my relationship with Dandelion, who I talked about already, I love them, uh, is so deep that I can call on the medicine of the spirit of the plant, even if I don't have any plant material with me, right? We have a deep and intimate relationship and Dandelion herself will tell me who she wants to partner with, right? So Dandelion was like, mix me with yellow duck. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> Why is that? You know, come to find out that dandelion leaves have the highest food plant source of iron available, the highest amount of parts per million of iron and yellow dock root, which doesn't have a lot of iron in it, releases the iron in the dandelion. It's a whole thing, but you begin to apprentice with plants and they will teach you about your body as you learn about them. The other important reason why we keep it sim simple is communication. So we're talking about folk medicine here. So how do we spread the word? By keeping it simple, black lives matters, that's it. It doesn't have to have all this stuff, but it's just one thing. And so when it's one plant, I can tell you what dandelion does. But if I have to tell you about this mixture with dandelion in it, the message becomes convoluted and we're not able to effectively transmit information to each other. The other part about keeping it simple is an experimentation. When we use the same processes for making plants, 100 proof vodka, six weeks, <laughs> you know, fresh plant, 
then we are able to um, actually see experimental results. One of the worst things is when you look at scientific databases and they have done research on a combination of plants. It's like, that's not useful. We need to know what this plant does. Um, and so for experimentation's sake, um, being able to have a hypothesis and test it, we wanna work with one plant um, at a time. And a lot of herb schools don't teach this way and that's fine, but my lineage, we work this way. Um, the things change when you start using dead plant material, plants that have been dry, because those plants have lost their spirit or their life force energy, right? What do my people say? Water is life. When the plant dries, it becomes a different thing. In fact, the drier the plant, the more the plant acts like a pharmaceutical. And so you want to make that plant more pharmaceutical-like, you want to have more control over it right? Then you're going to dry it, you're going to powder it, you're going to put it in a capsule. But at that point, the medicine changes and it doesn't become safe anymore, right? It becomes pharmaceutical medicine and you need a qualified da-da-da-da-da in order to use it, you see? But when we keep it simple, when we keep it fresh and safe, it makes it accessible to everyone. Um, okay, so now, um, we are going to uh, open up the questions and answers. Uh, and let's, let's talk about some of, the, huh, some of the content. I think we have about three more minutes. So who would like to ask a question? Can we start with the ones that were in chat? Yes. Because um, those, those were asked a little while ago. Okay. Um, the first one was, could you speak to cutting and harvesting in its relationship to herding plants? Uh-huh. So most humans, uh, most people don't really understand plant beings. And so plants actually like to be, especially mint family plants. Yo, the more you harvest them, the more they grow. If you read my favorite book, Braiding Sweetgrass, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> Yes, right. What is what is um what does she tell us about sweetgrass? What do we learn? You can't okay. harvest it. You have oh, it has to it has to be gifted to you. Right. So she's that's one of them. But one of the things she said is that uh, sweetgrass grows in response to being harvested, and that Native and Indigenous people on the East Coast were losing sweetgrass because no one was harvesting it anymore. And so these, a lot of our plants require active relationship in order for them to stay with us. And so mint family plants and a lot of different plants, the more you harvest them, the stronger they grow. Plants want to be useful. Um, in terms of cutting roots, um, <sighs> harvesting the roots of the plants is always a sacrifice especially and only if it's a perennial plant. And that means plants that um, have a lifespan for more than two years, perennial plants get stronger with each year. A perennial plant would be echinacea, for example, um, which shouldn't be used unless it's five years old or ginkgo. These are perennials. So taking those roots mean you take the life of the plant. Indigenous people have found that the medicine that's in the root is also usually found in the seeds. So instead of digging up roots, they'll usually make remedies of the seeds and you don't see a lot of Western herbalists doing this. The other thing about roots is that if it's a biennial plant like yellow dock or burdock, they're gonna, they're gonna die. <laughs> so they want you to harvest their roots, right? Um, I hope that was useful. Is there another question, William? Yes, the second question that I saw was, it looked like a two-part question. Um, Hold on. One, Can we do one thing, though? Yeah. I want to allow people to leave because our time, our time has come. <laughs> and I want to give folks space to be able, uh, I will be on 15 minutes past 1230, but William will have to leave and other people will have to leave. So I want to respect, um, respect your time. Uh, and, and for anyone who um, 
<laughs> yes. So for anyone who would like to leave right now, um, my contact information is here. Uh, you can find me at Bones, Bugs, and Botany and to go deeper in some of these questions that we won't be able to answer. Um, and before you leave, I would like for all of us to maybe type one word into the chat box um, to say like something that stuck with us from this from this time. Simple <laughs> breathing. Possibility for health, relation, relationship, radical healing is our liberation. Listen, relationship, relationship, apprentice with plants, wellness, bioregional simplicity, power, life, apprenticeship, relationship, 500 years to be indigenous, plural, versity, versality, <laughs> sovereignty, bioregional connection, resilience, and gratefulness, patriarchy, and some herbalism practice. Yeah, we didn't even get to talk about the three forms of herbalism via Susan Weed, my favorite. Inspiration, interdependence, relationship, beautiful people. And so with that, I do wanna bring our session to a close for all of you that have to leave. Thank you so much for practicing being in the plant portal with me. I hope that what you learned will be useful to your own practice. Um, if I said anything that was offensive, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cause harm, um, but I just wanna share how much love and joy you all have brought to me um, in being here with me today. So thank you uh, for anyone who has to leave. <laughs> if, if you just wanna put the slide up with your contact info, cause I don't have that anywhere. And then people can know how to reach out to you, your website, whatnot, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, look how good I am at Zoom now. So here's my contact information. And I'll just leave this up as we, um, as we continue our Q&A.